Hi, my name is Simon Bennett and I'm the OSAP founder and project lead. So this is a series of training sessions I'm giving to the folks here at Stackhawk about ZAP. And so there are quite a few people on this call. They may ask questions. Uh, but if you're watching later, then um, if you've got any questions, please ask them uh, in the comments section below. So I'm going to share my screen. And what I'll do now is I'll kick off ZAP. So I do have it installed, not surprisingly, on my MacBook. So I'll kick it off. And what I'm going to actually show you is ZAP290. Uh, we are actually quite close to um, publishing, uh, releasing ZAP210, but it's not quite out. And I hopefully this uh, video will be published before ZAP210 is. I don't want to confuse things, and I can do another session afterwards uh, explaining the differences and what's new. So the first thing you'll see uh, after the uh, splash screen is there's this question about, do you want to persist the ZAP session? Uh, and the reason this is here is because we found that a lot of people were actually starting Zap and they were running it and doing a whole lot of things. And at, at the end, they decided they wanted to save their session because the Zap session is where everything is recorded. So if you want to go back and see what you did or any of the results, then you'll need to load the Zap session. And by default, it wasn't being saved. Um, and we kind of use the word persisted rather than saved because Zap actually uses an HSQL DB. So it is always saving stuff to the database. The only difference is by default, that database will get lost when you exit Zap. Um, whereas if you say you want to persist it, then it will be saved. Uh, but, but what we found is that people, as I said, were persisting their sessions at the end. And what happened was we were then having to copy the entire existing database and taking a long time. So if you say you want to persist the session at the beginning, it's much more efficient because then Zap will just keep on writing to the same database and that one won't get deleted. Uh, so that's why we have this question at the beginning. If you choose not to persist it and then want to save it later, that's okay. It will just take a while to save. So that is why well, this dialogue is here, but um, I don't want to persist the session, so I'm just going to carry on. And what we have now is, so I'm going to talk through um, the, well, actually, first of all, I want to explain is why the Zap desktop is kind of important, uh, even if you want to use Zap for automation. So Zap is actually using the same underlying code. So it works in exactly the same way if you're using the desktop or if you're using the daemon mode and API. And it's much easier to see what's going on in the desktop than it is with the API, because uh, you can see what you can see everything that's happening. Um, and the thing is, you can configure and test everything in the desktop and then export those um, configurations to use via the daemon API. And you can actually run the API against the Zap desktop and it will work in exactly the same way. You can see what's going on. And when I get on to actually showing you the API, then I'll probably do that. And finally, the UI um, and the API actually reflect the code and the data structures. So the more you understand the desktop, the more it'll, you'll understand the Zap um, structures and how it's working. So um, as I said, the, the API tends to reflect that as well. So if you understand the desktop, the API makes more sense and how you can control Zap will make more sense as well. So with this screen, um, you'll see we have a set of uh, toolbars up here. So I'm just gonna minimize that. So we have, uh, so, so we have a set of menu items. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, uh, apart from saying, you know, quite a few of these things are available in multiple ways, but the reports menu is you can only get to it here and importing, I think that's the only way you can get there as well. Then we have this toolbar and the toolbar allows you to control a whole load of things. And if you hover over any of these buttons or if you hover over any buttons anywhere in Zap, then it'll actually show you a little uh, pop-up explaining what the uh, button actually does. We then have three windows. We have three windows by default. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, so we have on the left-hand side, we've got the sites tree. And this window typically shows hierarchical data. Then on the 
kind of the main window here is kind of a, a work area where we where you tend to interact with Zap. And then down at the bottom is much more informational. You can kick things off down here, but it's more information rather than where you interact directly with. Now I said that there are, you know, this is the default layout. Some of the uh, buttons on the toolbar actually change that. So one thing we can do is if you prefer the sites tree to be bigger, so expand, expand, expand down to the bottom, you can do that. Uh, or switch back to the um, information tabs being bigger. Or you can actually have a layout where all of the tabs are in the same window. Uh, I tend to go with this one, but of course you can adjust, you can change the where all these window, you know, how much space each of these windows take up. And there's also an option for um, hiding the tab names. So you can have, so if you want to get on a small screen, you might actually want to have um, everything in one window and hide the tab names. But I'm going to, I've got plenty of space here, so I'm going to show the names and I'm going to show the, the three windows. And you'll also see that these tabs, uh, these windows, quite a few of them, they all have this green button and this green tab. And if you click on that, then you'll see a set of options. And um, what this means is we actually have more tabs but, um, than we show by default. And so you can select any of these and that tab will appear. The reason we stop showing all the tabs by default is people are getting a bit overwhelmed, particularly newcomers. So we have a control up here to show all of the tabs. And you can see now that all of these windows have a lot more tabs and you can see why it's a bit more overwhelming for people. And you can uh, also hide all of them as well. Now, what you may notice is that actually says hide unpinned tabs, because what we can do is if there are any tabs that you use regularly, then you can pin them. So there's a scripts tab here, and when I'm playing around with Zap scripts, I will have that open, and so I pin that. And that means that even if you show all of the other tabs, when you choose to close them all, then any pinned tabs will stay. So the tabs you use regularly, you can pin them, and when you start Zap, those tabs will, will, will always be shown. And finally, at the bottom here, we have a um, footer, and this shows various information. So we've got summary information about the alerts that Zap has found, uh, the primary proxy details, and what we call current scans. And these are kind of really background tasks, uh, and we'll see some of those uh, in a bit. So what I want to do now is talk about the quick start screen, because this is a good place to start if you're new to Zap. And so we have this quick start tab and there are three big buttons. Um, first one I'm going to show you is the learn more because we have the option for, uh, so this is where you can learn more information. We've got local resources. So we've got a getting started guide. Uh, so this is a PDF, uh, so you can print it off easily. Uh, it's available online as well, but this is really good quite short document to, it's worth reading just to understand the, the basics behind Zap. Then we have the desktop user guide, and that's available by this link, uh, but it's also available by the question mark as well. And that actually starts on my other screen by default for some reason, so I'll just move it back. And this explains everything about all of the screens and some of the information behind Zap as well. So there's a whole series, uh, a lot of information about the features that Zap has. We also have online resources, We've got the website, um, various videos, and this video will be on that website as well, and the user group. And the user group is a great place to start if you've got any questions about Zap. So next, what I want to talk about, about is the automated scan. So this is a way of just getting started quite quickly with Zap. And all you need to do is put in the URL to attack, and you should have per only put in URLs that you have permission to attack. And Zap will remember the last few. Uh, Bodget is a little one, so obviously I have permission to attack that. And that's uh, one of my standard ones for playing around with. Uh, yes, we've got various options, but I'm going to leave these the default. And then I'm going to click on this attack button. Now, what I'd like you to do is just have a look down at this bottom set of, uh, this bottom window and bottom set of tabs. Because when I click on attack, you'll see that the spider tab appears and kind of very quickly goes through and um, 
shows a progress bar, have you noticed that? And now we're active scanning and this will take a bit longer. So what happens is the tabs will appear as and when required. So not all of them will do this, uh, but some of them will. And some of them, so things like the breakpoints tab, that's one which you'd have to choose to display. But when you start certain things like the spider active scan, um, that's when those these tabs will appear and you can see what's going on. So one thing you'll notice, um, a lot of the tabs have their own toolbars and quite often they have um, this gear icon, which you will find up on the main toolbar as well. So this is the options. And if you click on the options button at the top, you will actually, it'll just start at the beginning. Whereas if you click on the, I mean, this one will take, the active scan is first, if you go to the spider and click on options, then it'll take you to the spider options. What the automated scan does, it first explores your application using the traditional spider by default, option in the Ajax spider, and then forms an active scan. And I'm gonna talk about the spiders and exploring your application in much more detail in the, uh, in the next episode. So once the attack is complete, or if you actually stop it, then by default, we'll show this alerts tab. So the alerts tab is where you can see details of the vulnerabilities. And if you click on any of these, you can, clear, you can see the vulnerability details here. If you double click, you'll actually get a lot more information and or you can see it more easily. And you can change anything you like. And we will also select the request and response. And you'll see that uh, if we have any evidence, then that will be highlighted in the response for these alerts. And in some cases, we actually have lots of instances of alerts so you can kind of go through all of these in detail. So the alerts tab is where you can find out the details of the potential vulnerabilities that Zap has found. And you'll see now at the bottom in the footer, we can actually see that there are you know, two high level, one medium level, seven medium, and that's reflected in these the counts down here. Now we've actually got some content. I could actually show you, I'll go back to the sites tree because there are kind of three windows, informational windows, which I think are very important. And the sites tree is absolutely key, actually. So this is a hierarchical representation of your application. And in fact, it is Zap's internal representation of your application. And this is kind of key because if it doesn't understand your application properly, then it won't be able to attack it effectively. And this is something that I'll go into in a lot more detail in future sessions. But if you, you can kind of see all of the requests and again, you can select them and the requests and responses will be shown in this work area. Then we have the history. And this is the history of all the things you've done rather than all the tools that Zap has kicked off. So we can see we've actually only made one request, which was what happened when we kicked off the automated scan. So Zap made this request and then kicked off the tools. And we can see that, you know, these are all the requests that the spider made, and then these are some of the requests that the active scan made. There are the tools, things like the spider and the active scan, we can actually kick off in various different ways. Obviously with the the automated scan here, this starts the spider and option the Ajax spider and the active scanner. But if you go to the spider uh, tab, you can kick off a new scan. And so you can then type in your starting point, or you can select it from the sites tree, or you can actually go here and you can right click and we've got a whole, you can see all the attack options. And I should point out that the right click options are context sensitive. So it's another way we're trying to actually hide some of the complexity from, of Zap from people who are new to the application. So the right click options I get here are different from the ones that I'll get the, when I click on the messages in the spider. They'll be a little bit different from the ones I get in the history. And if we look at any particular request, then we'll get a different set of um, right click options there. So in general, wherever you are in Zap, try right clicking because chances are you'll get a whole load of extra information. So, and finally, you can actually launch a lot of the tools from the tool, well, 
not quite finally because you can there's you've got the toolbar menu sorry the tool menu and you'll see you can kick off the spider here and other tools and also if you have a look you'll see that we have some hotkeys as well so in this case um, for the spider it's the uh, command option one so if I on my keyboard do command option s then that'll bring up the spider as well. Now you may notice that quite a few of these dialogues also have advanced options and those are ones which I will go through in more detail when I get to these specific tools. Now one other thing is now I've got some content I can talk a little bit more about some of the other things um, and one of these is this mode. So we have different modes that you can run Zap in and if you hover over here you'll see they are described. So if you remember when I right clicked here we had the option to attack and we could do all sorts of nasty things. If I put zap into safe mode then you'll see when I right click here all of these things are disabled. Now this might be seem like a bit of a strange thing you know why would you want to have a tool where you can't do anything. Uh, zap will allow you to do some things but it won't allow you to do anything which is potentially attacking the app target application and this can be very useful say if you want to diagnose a problem on your production website and you want to actually see what's going on but you don't want to change anything so you could then put zap into safe mode and you will be sure that zap won't do anything nasty we also have this option of protected mode and now if i right click anything then you'll see everything's still disabled and the reason for this is because i haven't told zap what is important to me I haven't told it what's in scope. So that is where this the idea of contexts appear. And contexts are really, they are essentially just groups of URLs. So they could be an application, they could be part of an application, but they're a way of grouping URLs so that you can associate different properties with them. We have a default context and you can add various regexes to say what's in scope or what's included in this context but it's much easier to use the right click options so here i'm going to right click on budget and i'm going to include it in a context i'll actually include a, it in a new context so that will then we'll get this new context which by default is just called the same name as the um, site or the the node so it's called budget here and we will see that including in context we've got this regex that zap has put in for us so i'll okay that and you'll now see that all of these nodes have a little target icon um, and that is to indicate that they are actually in scope so because they're in scope now when i go into the attack mode i can actually attack them so i've told zap what is in scope and now zap will allow me to attack anything within scope and if i go up to the higher level and right click you'll see that I still don't have any options there to attack because I'm not in scope because there's no target icon and if you want to do things quickly you can actually right click on any of these contexts and you can remove from scope you see the target icon disappears from budget and disappears from all the sites tree as well and if I right click then I won't be able to do any attacking um, and then standard mode means I can just attack anything I like. So I can attack budget or I can attack um, local host as well. There is a fourth mode and attack mode, but that's one I'll cover when I start talking about the active scanner. So the idea of context and scope, contexts are very useful when we start getting to automation and because what we can do is we can associate more information and some of that information will include things like authentication. So as soon as we want to do anything like authentication, that's when we'll need to start using context because until you have, until Zap has a, a context, it doesn't know what you're talking about really. So one of the reasons for creating context is to be able to define authentication, but we can also um, do other things and we can define how the structure of the application maybe non-standard and that's something which i will explain in a future um, episode because the sites tree and the structure and zaps understanding of the application is actually key for it to be able to attack applications effectively we can also define the technology um, and what this will allow us to do is if we know 
if we're doing kind of white box, tech box testing, so we know what technology is behind an application, we can tell that if you know that Zap, uh, your application isn't using a database, you can actually deselect this, and then Zap won't bother trying to do any attacks which would target databases. If you're doing black box testing where you don't know what's behind the application, you probably shouldn't use any of these options. So, and I'll, I will go through all of these things in more detail, but that's just a kind of quick overview of context, why they're important and how they tie in with this, this mode. One of the final things I want to talk about is the options. And one thing we'll see here is there are actually a huge number of options. If I just go down, you'll see there is just loads and loads of things. And part of this, part of the reason of having all these options is again to hide the complexity, but it's also because attacking applications and dynamically scanning applications is actually very hard. And there are so many different ways that applications do things. And so what we have is we have these options which allow you to tell Zap how to attack your applications more effectively. We try and make sure that Zap understands applications by default, but it is really hard. And so what we so the first step we have is making sure that Zap can actually cope with all the weird and wonderful things that people do when creating applications. So hopefully whatever application you've created or somebody has created, Zap will be able to cope with it. But you might need to configure Zap to actually understand it better to be more effective at attacking it. And that's why we have so many different options. We would definitely, we would love to be able to make Zap understand how applications work by default, um, you know, be able to understand them by, by introspection, by querying the application, but that's hard. Um, and those kind of things can go wrong. So the first step is actually making sure Zap can understand and can cope with everything and allowing you as the person controlling Zap to actually configure it. The next step is the auto making Zap handle these things automatically and that's typically quite a hard step and one we haven't got to in many cases. So there are lots of options and lots of ways you can configure Zap and lots of ways you can control it uh, as you'll see with all of the different options we have. This is kind of, I've probably got a fairly standard setup for Zap, uh, but we actually have a whole load of add-ons that are available online. So if you click on this manage um, add-ons button, you'll see all of the add-ons that we have that I've got installed. So Zap has this add-on option. Even if you haven't installed any add-ons, by default, you'll get a whole load of them. And we have this online marketplace. So I'll do a check for updates. Um, and we'll see these are all of the add-ons that I haven't, e haven't installed yet. So you can select any of these and you can see the information about it. If you're interested, if you think there might be something um, that Zap can't cope with and you can't, can't find it in, your, uh, in Zap that you've got installed, then have a look on the marketplace and hopefully there'll be something there which will allow you to actually cope with whatever you need. That's kind of most of what I was going to go through. Oh, there's one final little thing. It is worth playing around with the desktop and clicking on things. So one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is you can actually configure the tables within Zap. So, I mean, you can, obviously you can kind of make these things bigger and you can change the order of the tables, but there's actually on all tables, there's this little very tiny button to the right hand side of the um, titles and you click on that, then you actually see all of the um, fields that you have that are visible and some which aren't visible. And then you can actually add those if you want. So you can actually show more information or less depending on what you want. And there are various other options for scrolling and all the other things. So there are loads of different options around. You just need to play around and right click everywhere. So that was kind of the uh, what I was planning on going through for this session. Are there any questions from anyone who's watching live? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, could you go a bit more into the site tree and how we might be able to control or uh, utilize some of that for the API? So basically, it is SAP's representation of the application. You need to make sure that your application is represented correctly. And by that, I mean that all of the functionality 
So each of these nodes, as far as Zap is concerned, is a different aspect of functionality for application. So if you, you'll see that we have a get on the basket is actually different from a post. And if we have different um, parameters to either gets or posts, then we will have different, uh, different nodes. You'll see here that we've actually got um, a search We've got uh, a get with on the search page and then a get with a query parameter. So one thing we can do, actually, we can launch browsers to mail explore Zap, um, the, your, your application, and we kind of remember the most recent ones. So by default, we have this HUD enabled. I'm not going to enable it now because that's a whole nother tutorial. But if I launch the browser, then Firefox will appear and we will actually be proxying, so we'll be proxying through Zap and we'll, have, we'll be ignoring any certificate errors. If I know, now go to the search box, so this is the search page we were looking at in Zap before, and if I just search for a few things, then search for different things, and now if we go down to the, we will see that in the history we'll see I've gone to the search page and I've searched for different things, but if we look in the sites tree, we've still got only one node for each of those. And that is because as far as Zap is concerned, if you have different parameter values, chances are it's the same functionality. And in this case, it is. It doesn't matter what you search for, Zap will, or the, the target application will still be trying to do the same thing with the search results. Um, if that's not the case for your application, you will need to tell Zap. Um, and we can do that via configuration and via the API. And that's something which, yeah, I'll have to go into in a lot more detail in a future session. Any other questions about the SAP desktop at this stage? Um, when you were configuring the scanner for the, uh, I think it was for a particular application or uh, localhost, uh, one of the settings or one of the tabs there was technologies and listing the, the various databases and the various operating systems by which the scan could operate under. How does hmm. Zap associate those technologies uh, with the plugins that it's going to look for? Sure. So Zap doesn't know a great deal about a lot of the plugins. We try and make sure that it understands as little as it needs to. So what happens is we have a set of um, scan rules, which I'll, so I'll need to go, th go through some more detail when it comes to active scanning, but the policy dictates all of the scan rules that will be run. So these are all the scan rules that I've got installed. So you can see I've got both release and beta quality scan rules. So what will happen is when you set the technology, Zap will actually run all of the scan rules that are in the policy you've selected. And it's up to those scan rules to act accordingly. So you'll see with the injection ones, we've got different injection rules for uh, MySQL and MSQL and for Oracle and SQLite. So when it comes down to technology, each of those scan rules will know which technology it can target. So the SQL injection scan rule for Oracle will know that it handles Oracle. So if you uncheck that, then this rule Will, will be called by Zap if it's part of the policy, but it'll go, okay, the, the Oracle technology is turned off, so I'm not going to do anything. Whereas the um, SQL Lite, SQL injection rule, will look at that and go, well, they won't even bother looking at the Oracle. It'll look at SQL Lite in the technology, see that's enabled, and it will still run. So it's down to the individual rules to um, act on that technology uh, option. I, I was more interested at a technical level how the policies uh, get associated with uh, technology flags. Manually. Manual. So that is a manual okay. process. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've we've talked about because um, we do have an add-on which does detect some technology. Um, so in theory we could um, try and work things out, but you know actually detecting which type of database is in use unless you actually have find an SQL injection vulnerability is very difficult. Um, so the whole idea is if you're doing white box text testing, then it's down to the tester to go, okay, I know this application is actually only using MySQL. 
and selecting that. So if you do that, then the zap scans will be a little bit quicker because it won't be trying all of these other things. But if you don't know what technology your application is using, so you're doing black box testing, uh, or if you're not sure in some cases for some of these other things, then it's much better to enable everything. Uh, Simon, which uh, extension is that for educational purposes? Which of the um, detecting things? Yes. It is, so Wappalizer. So the technology detection, so I haven't got installed. So what I'll do is I will install it. You'll see, actually you can see down there, there is that little one by the downloads. So you can see something's actually going on. And we have this uh, output tab down here and we'll see that now we actually finished installing and we've got this new technology tab here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very quickly go and spider um, bodge it again. And hopefully, is that going to work? What I'm going to do, the way the technology scan works from memory is that it works on the passive scanner. And you'll see down here that, so what happens with passive scanning is this happens in the background and we have a queue and that is what's going through there and i'm hoping that the technology um, scan rule will catch up and then we'll see some technology down here um, yep we can see that so we so it is now starting to detect some things any other questions okay well in that case uh i think we're done for this session. Thank you very much. Uh, next session, I'll be covering exploring applications. So thank you very much and until next time.